As the COVID-19 pandemic rages on in most parts of the world, how are Agilists finding meaning and purpose in these troubled times? How can we connect, inspire, and support each other? In days gone by, Caravan's Rise provided rest, recovery, and community for travelers along the ancient Silk Road. Similarly, we hope that our Agile Caravan Sarai episodes will provide rest, inspiration, and hope. We hope each episode will remind us of our shared Agile values and thus bring us closer together. In past episodes, we've heard from Agile Manifesto authors like Jim Highsmith, Kent Beck, and Alistair Coburn. We've connected with captains of industry like Michael Kara from Nationwide Insurance. We've also heard from global Agile titans, including Rashina Hoda, and Evan Leyburn from Australia, and Naresh Jain from India. As we begin to see the glimmers of hope for the end of the pandemic, Agilists continue to respond with resilience. This is a time for transformation. I invite you to join me as we continue our journey together. I'm Sanjeev Augustine, and this is Agile Kervin Sarai. Mary Lynn Manns is an author, educator, and leading change consultant based in Asheville, North Carolina in the United States. I've had the privilege of knowing Mary Lynn for close to two decades. Along with Linda Rising, she's the co-author of the Fearless Change books. Fearless Change Patterns for Introducing New Ideas was released in 2005. And More Fearless Change Strategies for Making Your Ideas Happen came out 10 years later in 2015. Marilyn has presented and led workshops for conferences and organizations such as Microsoft, Amazon, Procter and Gamble, and Avon. Marilyn has also had a very distinguished 38-year career as a professor at UNC Asheville, where she is now a professor emerita. Marilyn Manns. It's been over 20 years since the signing of the Agile Manifesto. And uh, seeing as how you've been a stalwart in the Agile space and moved so much along during the last 20 years, we're interested in hearing what your impressions of, on the Agile movement are for, uh, over the last 20 years. Well, um, my favorite part of the Agile Manifesto has been and probably always will be Responding to change over following a plan. Because Sorry. when I, do you like that one? Yeah. Like that one too? Well, when I first heard these words uh, in the manifesto years ago, I thought about all the strategic plans I've seen over the years. And I wondered if people would buy into respond to change over following a plan. In other words, just because those brilliant words were written didn't mean that everyone was saying, oh, yes. I see the light, let's do this now. I wondered this because in the early days of fearless change, I would talk about in my presentations and workshops, you know, about the importance of responding to change when building a change initiative. But I would see this kind of wrinkle on management faces as if they were thinking, what? What about all those plans we wrote? But on the, on the bright side, by the time of our second book, we observed a pattern we titled Evolving Vision. Mm. We included it in the More Fearless Change book because we saw that managers were recognizing that a lofty vision can seem attainable in the beginning, but can quickly become unreasonable as the world changes around them. So um, perhaps this could be because so many of them have been beat up by dealing with changes during the process of making a change initiative happen. Because change happens one person at a time mm -hmm. and because people are not predictable. So it appears that many managers are now open to using more of a baby step and reflect approach in order to make adjustments and learn along the way. Of course, there are many great methods for doing this in Agile. But the point is, we know that just writing the words in the manifesto doesn't make them happen. Right. However, I believe that the support for responding to change over following a plan portion of the manifesto has only become stronger 
Um, I've seen that software developers and project managers have recognized the value in this. And as I reflect, I think this is an exciting and promising growth in the movement. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have a question for you, though. Uh -huh. um, so you talked about the difficulty or the reluctance of managers uh, to this idea of change. I wonder, and I have this mental image of uh, maybe around February, perhaps even as late as March of, la of 2020, mm -hmm. uh, of managers having to take all the strategic plans that they had written up and tear them and shred them because they're not worth a fig. At, they weren't worth a fig at that time. In fact, I'm not sure, you know, even now as we start to come out of the pandemic, um, that any vision can be sustained over six months and maybe even it has to be evolved every three months. Yeah. So your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, so, you know, these wonderful strategic plans, and I was involved with many of them, these five year strategic plans, you know, these even 10 year strategic plans are nice for um, looking into the future and getting excited. But the problem is you're dealing with people. Yeah. Um, in the, even when you're doing a change initiative or you're doing anything and people are unpredictable. So what you were talking about was this external force that we, the pandemic that we never dreamed of, although we should have, we never dreamed of it. But think about something that's constantly changing in your organization, and that's the people and the attitudes of people and the feelings of people and the emotions of people and what people can do and people coming and going. So that's what makes um, changes and strategic plan changes hard to implement, you know, and etch them in stone and make them happen. So having experienced one Black Swan event in, uh, in recent years, perhaps we should not bury our heads in the sand again and think that it's not going to happen again and yeah. start to prepare for another scenario where or one or two black swan events might happen uh, in maybe in the next six months or next year so thanks for that uh, marilyn uh -huh. um next question and yeah. uh this is how are you personally doing in the pandemic well, um, during the pandemic, I learned, like so many of us, that I can communicate and work online quite effectively. Mm -hmm. um, the software tools around us have been around us for a long time, and many of us discover their full potential. We use the tools quite successfully during the pandemic. But I believe this worked well for me because I had already built a strong network of colleagues, both in and outside the Agile community, and I built this network in person. So people like you, I met and worked with so many wonderful pe people in many different organizations and countries. But the point is most of these were in person at conferences and workshops and presentations I did and interviews for Fearless Change. So in-person events allow uh, that accidental and unexpected expected you know hallway talk you know that maybe you and i even had you know in restaurants and chats and outside the conference sessions you know so i found this is where the true magic happens for sparking ideas and for meeting new people that can become long-term colleagues and friends so this is what I thought a lot about during the pandemic. I thought a lot about those younger professionals who had their in-person network building come to a halt during the pandemic. And it has even slowed, it slowed down over the next year or so. This is a long time when you're starting out in your career. Right. This is a long time, right? Without that hallway talk as a method for building your network. So to address your question, um, I am preparing for the next post-pandemic normal by meeting with people in person as often as I can, because I've learned to appreciate even more the value of in-person communication for batting around ideas and for building stronger relationships than you can do via Zoom or Twitter or LinkedIn. And now that I think about it, this loosely applies to the another part of the manifesto, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. I mean, thank goodness we have tools like Zoom and Twitter, but uh, let's not get too comfortable with these and rely on them. I'd like to encourage all professionals, all our listeners, especially those who are early in their careers, 
uh, to embrace the act of in-person options for mining and forming ideas, building their professional networks, networks, and what can I say for making change happen? And just connecting and evolving and co-evolving as people, you know, mm -hmm. that happens through interactions and it's the richer the interactions, the richer the evolution. So. And the accidental interactions, you know, that you don't expect that you just don't get online. Nothing like serendipity at work. Yeah. <laughs> you and I could tell many stories, I'm sure, about that. Well, that's awesome. So let's get into our third question, which is uh -huh. given that we're starting to come out of the pandemic and you have this wonderful personal advice to, uh, especially for our younger listeners, yeah. to connect as often in person, what other advice would you give to your many fans out there uh, for the next 5, 15, 20 years of the next 20 years of the Agile movement? I think if we've learned anything, um, embrace change, right? And accept that when you are attempting to persuade people to change to something like Agile, you are working with beings who are full of emotions and feelings. Mm -hmm. They are not logical robots yeah. or Mr. Spock for our fans of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. So um, when you're persuading them, you can give them all the information, data, and copies of the manifesto that you want. And they will likely understand what you're saying. But you need to take your persuasion efforts to the next step by addressing how your listeners feel about what you're saying. Because it is those feelings that can hijack your efforts to make a change. So embrace change and then understand people's feelings during times of change. Because getting them to understand what you're saying is relatively easy. You know, we're all pretty good at explaining things, right? We, we learn how to do that in school. But helping them to care, to care about what you're saying requires that you create not just a logical connection with your listeners, but an emotional connection too. Mm -hmm. So this emotional connection, you know, how do you do that? Well, um, stories, telling stories, instead of giving a bunch of collection of data, you know, tell stories that joins the data together into something that people will remember and repeat. And um, you can also use some of the techniques we write about in Fearless Change, such as wake up call, imagine that, shoulder to cry on, personal touch, and by the way, your listeners can find a summary of all these techniques, these patterns on our website, fearlesschangepatterns.com. That's awesome, Marilyn, which actually took me into the final part. Thank you uh -huh. for all of these uh, answers to the questions. Yeah. Any other references where people can find more information about what you're up to? Uh, your, uh, are you, are you writing, writing a new book, another edi edition? or? No, Linda and I have written two books, Fearless Change and More uh -huh. Fearless Change. And now what we've heard from so many people over the years is that they want to learn how to use the patterns. The so we put scenarios on our website. I'm blogging now. And we're talking mostly about now that we have, we have all these patterns, how can people actually use them? And we're trying desperately to get an app going because we had one in beta form and it was just so useful. And we want to take that to the next step where people can say, I have this information, I have this problem, and I need some information on how to yeah, make this solution happen. Awesome. So fearlesschange.com. Yeah, fearlesschangepatterns.com. Fearlesschangepatterns.com. Fearless change right. We'll make sure we put it in the write up. So okay. thank you. Thank you once again, Marilyn. Really appreciate your time. It was great catching up with you. Oh, great catching up with you too. Thank you so much.